in the name of God who calls us each by name. Each year, the clergy of a parish are required to have an annual checkup appointment with the bishop. There, he usually asks about your health, our families, our prayer life, our church life. He wonders what questions we have, and then he asks us anything else he wants to know. A long time ago, when Bishop von Rosenberg was a bishop, he tried to talk to me about call. He said, you've been at the same place since you got out of seminary. As you can continue to discern God at work in your life, what is it that you believe God is now calling you to do? He and I had a pretty good relationship, so he only laughed when I said, are you kidding me? Trying to discern God's call is what got me here in the first place. I'm sure not gonna do that again. We both laughed, but deep down, we both knew I was just a little bit serious. Following God is not always easy. In fact, sometimes it is downright difficult. It takes you places you do not want to go and ask of you things that you do not want to do, like in our reading from Jonah this morning. But it is what we are called to do, each and every one of us. But just because you're trying to follow Jesus doesn't mean that the rest of your life is going to be smooth sailing. But it sure beats spending some quiet time to reconsider sitting in the belly of a whale. Our lectionary blend this morning gives us sharp contrast in how people respond to God's calling. Jonah was called by God to be a prophet to the city of Nineveh. But instead of going east to the city where God wanted him to go, he gets on a boat and goes west, as far away as he can from what God is calling him to do. He is headed to the seacoast of Tarshish, some 2,500 miles away. His epic adventure includes being thrown overboard from a ship, swallowed by a whale or big fish, and finally thrown up at the very same place he started running from this mission. Now, we could certainly fault Jonah for his lack of faith or courage, but what if we try to understand and identify with him? Jonah was given a mission impossible. Nineveh was one of the greatest cities of its day. It was a city of conquerors with a strong commercial base, superior technology, and a powerful war machine. But it was also a wicked city. Jonah was from a strip of wilderness that the rest of the world passed by as a way station to get somewhere else. Jonah had no credentials for such an act of international diplomacy. Imagine suddenly being sent to a country where the government is perpetuating genocide of Christians. God tells you to march through that hot, hot desert by yourself and tell their leaders to repent, to stop the genocide, to hold democratic elections and respect everyone's civil rights and use their wealth for the good of all the nation's people. Do you think you would get their leadership to dress up in sackcloth and ashes? For that matter, imagine going to Washington, D.C. these days and trying to preach bipartisanship, demanding that elected officials stop bickering and learn to work together for the common good. Do you think you could bring both houses of Congress to wear sackcloth and ashes? Jonah had an impossible mission, and he may be one of our patron saints because the world conspires to make Jonah's of all of us. We listen to the voices that tell us not to make waves, to go with the flow, think only of ourselves, because one person can't make a difference, that whatever you do, it won't matter, because we'll never change the big picture. Our values may tell us we need to head east to Nineveh to fight the evils of prejudice, bigotry, and racism, but we turn around <clears throat> and walk west and get on a boat with Jonah because it just seems too hard. We spend some of our precious time sitting in the belly of the whale, out of touch with our calling and our sense of meaning and purpose. But then we see 22-year-old Amanda Gorham 
deliver her poem, The Hill We Climb, last week at the inauguration, and we know that nothing is hard enough to run from. Born prematurely and struggling with a speech impediment, Amanda's profoundly inspired speech, calling for truth and justice, led her to confront our own modern day Nineveh. And thinking it was too hard to do so, clearly never entered her mind. I remember an older book called The Politics of Meaning, written by Michael Lerner. In it, he says that too often we give up on our deepest held values of compassion, caring, and community because they do not seem practical in the real world. Instead, an ethos of selfishness and materialism prevails by default. These are the values that we settle for when our deeper values seem out of reach. Whether we consider ourselves liberal or conservative or apolitical, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, or New Age, individualism and materialism are powerful determiners of our lives. We may not have meaningful work or chances to make a difference, but materialism tells us that we can at least have the latest new iPhone and drive a fancy car. I saw the other day, this is an aside, I saw the other day where Joel Olstein drives a Ferrari 458 Italia, Italia, which is actually very similar to the Subaru Foresters that Derek and I drive. We may not be able to bring about racial reconciliation or even have the kind of relationships we want, but individualism tells us that we can pursue our own happiness and carve our own little niche for peace of mind. But God is calling us to go to Nineveh, not the swanky seacoast city of Tarshish. Ironically, these shallow attitudes give us less freedom and less power. Selfishness and materialism erode community and make it less possible to live the life we want. It disconnects us from our purpose and our calling. Jonah's way seems easier at first, but in the end it is not because God is still with us, calling us wherever we go. There's another interesting twist here. God's love for the outcast makes an interesting scriptural twist. God once again pays tribute to the outsider, the other, the enemy. Anyone who knows the stories of Balaam, Ruth, and the Good Samaritan should recognize this in the residence of Nineveh. In contrast to the insider Jonah, who hears God's word and repeatedly disobeys, the Ninevites hear a one sec one sentence sermon and repent. All through scripture, the key to faithfulness is responsiveness. Adam and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah hear a call and go. The fishermen receive an invitation and follow. Here it is not the insider who can recite. Israel's sacred songs by heart, who truly knows the heart of the Lord. No, it's the Ninevites, the foreigners and the enemies who hear God's voice and believe, and even more put their belief into action. Though they stand outside the special revelation available to God's people, Israel, they act the part of the faithful, those who should know what kind of God they worship and serve. Jonah is the best player of the role of the unfaithful insider. It is clear that Jonah is familiar with the heart of the Lord's revelation. He continually acts if he does, as if he does not. He attempts to flee from a God who is inescapable. He preaches destruction without God's justice or mercy. The one who knows the Lord acts as if he doesn't, and the ones who don't know the Lord act as if they do. Now, isn't that a statement for us to ponder? At the end of his story, Jonah specifies his reason for resistance. That is why I was so quick to flee Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In other words, Jonah wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. He felt they deserved God's judgment. 
Jonah didn't want to see God's mercy extended to his enemies. And he knew in his heart that God's intention was to show mercy. Jonah discovered that God's salvation is available to all who repent, not just to the people of Jonah's choosing. In the end, the book of Jonah is not primarily about Jonah. It is about God. It is a story of God's love, mercy, and steadfast love, proclaiming not just God's displeasure and threatening destruction. It is about knowing who God is and proclaiming that message of love and mercy. When God rebukes Jonah at the end of the story, God points out that if Jonah was concerned about a bush, how much more could God be concerned about the city of Nineveh with its more than 120,000 inhabitants? This is a story about the universalizing of God's love and mercy. Jonah and the original readers of this text and us were being challenged to expand their notion of God and of God's love. For all God's love and concern for the Jewish people in the post-exilic period, the Hebrew Bible and the book of Jonah bear witness to a growing understanding that God is God of all creation, the God of all humanity, and God's love and mercy extends to all humans, even to one's enemies. I wonder how many of us are like Jonah, so hardened in our attitude, so critical of those with whom we disagree, that what we really want to do is see them destroyed. We proclaim God's judgment on our opponents, but do we ever consider what might happen if they changed their minds, if they repented of the actions that we regard as sinful, evil, oppressive, and unjust? Are we like Jonah? who having delivered our prophetic message in the most self-righteous of language and attitude are now sitting above the city waiting for its destruction? Or can we imagine that God might accept the repentance and show mercy? And that's a message for us as well. Like Jonah, that is what God is calling us to do as individuals and as a congregation. The God who is calling us is not a God of wrath and destruction, no matter how much some Christian groups in our culture would have us believe. The God who calls us is unimaginable in the extent of his love, mercy, and patience. It is that God we have experienced ourselves in the forgiveness of our own sins. It is that God we are called to share with a world that knows hate and fear and violence and brokenness. It is that message, a message we know for ourselves that we need to bring to those around us. And we need to proclaim it throughout our community and the world. Wherever there is animosity and hate, whatever enemies we fear, God's steadfast love and mercy reaches in a time when hatred between people and religion, in a time when racism seems as inintractable as ever, we need to hear this message of Jonah. In just a minute, we will hear John Bell's um, hymn, Take, O Take Me As I Am. It is very um, important and one of the most often used songs from the own community. But I have taken it as my own sort of mantra for the, for now. The words are, take me, you don't want me to sing it. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Amen. Amen.